to the 100th Monkey Radio with Tom and Ramon. Wow, Ramon. Uh, you know, I, I've been, the weather here, you know, I've talked about it in the last couple of shows that we've done. The weather here in Washington has been absolutely crazy. And today's no no different. But right right now, and just a few minutes ago, the uh, sun decided to, to raise its, its weary head and uh, poke through the clouds for me. So I think this is just freaking awesome. I just love it when when I get ready to start a show and the sun shines through the window. (laughs) I I take it as, here's your sign. Yeah, it's good stuff. (laughs) Uh, So what's been going on over in Japan, Ramon? Uh, Let's see. Nothing nothing much. I um, recently planted a, I mean, replanted my yuzu tree and I brought a big pot and, you know, put some rocks down in the bottom. And put some uh, um, charcoal, and put some more dirt, and put some more charcoal. Then I put a big piece of salmon in the bottom, and then put the plant in. So, salmon? What'd you put the salmon down there for? Uh, so when it starts to break down, uh, it gives nutrients. So instead of buying the um, the store brought. Um, so you're u- using that as fertilizer then? Yeah. That's a good idea. Does yeah. it, doesn't the house get a little smelly, or you have it out on the patio? It's out on the patio, and it's buried in under the roots, so you can't smell it. So I just got my, uh, I, I told you that I was putting a greenhouse together out back, so I, I enclosed half of my patio and turned it into a greenhouse, and uh, went down and uh, picked up a few things the other day, and you know, I've already got my uh, some of my winter greens growing. Uh, gonna should have plenty of lettuce all through the winter, and uh, my next step is to uh, transplant some of the stunted or the uh, I should say uh, late late blooming tomatoes that that popped up between all the rows and stuff out in the garden. I'm gonna put those in there and see what I can do for getting tomatoes out of the out of the greenhouse this winter. It's my first this first time I've tried to grow uh, edibles during the winter. I'm mean, gonna it definitely. It's definitely gonna be a learning process, I'm sure. Yeah, but it's a step in the right direction, which is the important part. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I should take some pictures. It turned out pretty good, actually. The greenhouse did so. Yeah, definitely take some pictures. Maybe you might inspire some people, or they can uh, help you out. I've been having uh, grasshopper problems, so I'm trying to, uh, different natural things. Uh grasshopper. Snatch yeah. the pebble from my hand. <laughs> Not that type of grasshopper, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. So, you know how I'm always talking about um, teleportation and stuff, and I found an article here. This is more uh, hard science. Um, researchers were able to reliably teleport information between quantum bits. So, I'll put that up. And Was, you know, was that done on that quantum computer? Uh, doesn't Prob- say, probably but, not. Probably not. It doesn't say, but um, you know, we're we're going towards the right direction at least publicly. But I think our guests might have some information. That's really exciting. The the, the guest we had on our live show last Saturday, uh, we had uh, uh, Cynthia Sue Larson on, and she brought in some information that just knocked my socks off. The first quantum computer is up and running. Uh, it was bought by what they what you say NASA and DoD. 
No, NASA and Google. Oh, that's right, NASA and Google. Well, same thing, DOD. <laughs> oh, boy, that's bad. But, yeah, they got the first quantum computer up and running. That's uh, that's really exciting stuff. I mean, that's that's huge for uh, all these all of us out here who've been been doing this stuff for so many years and and science has really stepped up to the plate here in the last decade and brought us so much verification for the things that we're that things that we've been talking about for ages uh so it's it's nice to have that validation and with this quantum computer i mean wow uh how good can it get right yeah how good can it get <laughs> that's the question <laughs> yeah so, so We've got an exciting guest for it with us tonight, Ramon. Or, or do you have anything else before we uh, uh, bring him on and get going? No, that's what I was going to say. Okay, well, Just we've got a, a real treat for you guys tonight. Uh, we've got Ed Kamarik, is a longtime UFO and ET investigator and activist, having been involved in the field of, for 40 years. He was involved in exopolitics long before the word exopolitics was coined by Alfred Weber a few years ago. For the past several years, Ed has written over 200 exopolitical essays on polit exopolitics published to this blog. And in the, I'm reading this off of his blog, which I'll share that with you in just a moment. And the Internet Press. The essays are regularly published in Message to Eagle, UFO Digest, the American Chronicle, the OPED News, the, Na the Canadian National Newspaper. Because these articles can be republished by anybody, they float about the internet, creating an extensive global exopolitical network feeding back into the blog. Recently, Ed published UFOs, uh, Exopolitics, and the New World Order, available on Amazon. That's his book, guys, and I would definitely urge you guys to take a look at this thing. It's, he did some fantastic work. Ed believes this to be the most extensive and detailed exopolitics book available to the public to date. With the publication of this book, Ed brings his writings to a much more advanced level and into a much tighter, concise, and well-edited format. The idea is to present a book to the public that is the, a foundational book for the newly emerging field of exopolitics. And his, uh, his blogs, blog ta, blogspot site is exopolitics.blogspot.com. Welcome to the 100th Monkey Radio, Ed Comeric. Am I pronouncing your last name right, by the way? Oh, that's good enough. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I do. I it, say. It, it, it's pronounced Comeric, but it, it's a Czech name. My grandfather uh, emigrated around the turn of, uh, of the century, uh, about 1900, from Czechoslovakia, from Bohemia. And uh, so it's not, it's a, not a, a common name in, in this country. Yeah, well, I, I do the same thing that you do. That's close enough when with my last name. My last name's Kappenman, and uh, it's a German name, and and it gets slaughtered. I've been called all sorts of different things, so <laughs> I definitely understand that. You know, Ed, uh, your your last name sounds more like a DJ name. Yeah, I, it, it's also uh, in when I was in Russia back in the early '90s, they said it meant little mosquito. And uh, I, I talked to some people in Czechoslovakia, you know, fairly recently and whatever, and it's the same thing there. Same thing there. So it's kind of apropos, I suppose, you know, going up against the uh, uh, New World Order crowd. Uh, that's why I titled the book. Uh, it's not really a New World Order. It's really uh, the same old, old world disorder. and. Right with the same elite, you know, pretty much in control as they've always been for hundreds of years, uh, you know, controlling uh, governments through the issuance and control of money primarily. Hmm. And uh, so I called the book UFOs, Exopolitics, and, and the New World Disorder in order to indicate that, you know, we're, we would like to move to a new world order that's democratic and it's not an Orwellian police state. And so... It's kind of been, the New World Order has been corrupted. I believe the Theosophical Society are one of the first people that came out with that, maybe uh, Alice Bailey and Madame Belatsky or whatever back in the 1800s. You know, they talked about a New World Order uh, of Enlightenment. And somehow that's been corrupted into this New World, this so-called New World Order, which is just uh, the old world disorder uh, repackaged in a new set of clothes. Uh, autocratic, uh, basically an autocratic uh, uh, 
system of control over large numbers of people as represented in the eye and the pyramid. Yeah. Well, you know what I find funny, Ed, is that is that we are moving into a new world order, and I think all of this, I mean, everything that we're doing out here on the fringe, you know, the the uh, exopolitical movements that are going on, all the, the, the awareness that's being raised with uh, with the the our brothers from out there in space and and with the big consciousness consciousness movement on the planet, we are definitely moving into a new world order. And I see that group grab that tagline and try to pollute it as much as they can, so that when whenever that word the, that phrase is brought up, new world order, it's automatically gets a negative. Uh, some sort of negative energy associated with it instead of uh, seeing it for what it is, which is we are moving into a new world order. So I don't know. How, how do you feel about that? Do you think that uh, I, that we are definitely moving into a new world order? Yeah, I, uh, I think so. You know, we're going to have a choice. You know, are we, we can, you know, we're either going to do one or two things. We're either going to keep moving forward and evolve to a higher state of consciousness, or are we going to fall back again like maybe we did 10,000 years ago and maybe other times? So, you know, uh, so my, my thinking is maybe we'll make it this time, and we're all the same, the same, a lot of the same people that are reincarnating at this time. Maybe we're reincarnating at the time of Atlantis, which didn't make it, and everything crashed back down. You know, some of that's in the Hindu, Hindu uh, scriptures, you know, the Mahabharata and uh, the Vedas and whatever, you know, of gods fighting in the sky, you know, shooting beams at each other and all kinds of weapons and, and bombs. And, you know, there's still radioactive cities uh, that they've dug up in India uh, that where the skeletons still have uh, are still radioactive from about eight to 10,000 years ago. So, you know, it's, everything tends to cycle, and from what I understand, as far as what the extraterrestrials are telling us, is that basically there has to be a certain level of love. Love is, love is kind of the glue that holds everything together, and it, and it, uh, society, in order to move to the next level, has to have a certain level uh, of love, compassion, and consideration for each other. And or otherwise, it crashes back, and actually, it, it creates a safety valve for these more advanced races because these because the less half civilized races by the time they make it into that new, new level of consciousness they become more civilized or their own disorder or their own hate or violence within their own system causes it causes a society to break back down again and fall back down to a lower state of consciousness so in a way some of these more higher advanced beings are protected from people like us by the very nature of the way the whole system operates. Mm. You know, that kind of reminds me of the uh, movie, the original one, the 1951, uh, When the Earth Stood Still. How much of that do you think um, actually did happen? Did you think um, somebody came here and, and gave us a warning and told us, hey, if you guys try to take that out there, we're not going to have it? Well, there, there were there, there's there's a number of cases that's back from that period of time, and that's what the the movie was you know drawing on. In fact, these movies you know are are pretty tightly connected with the intelligence community, and as you know, the movie industry is connected to the war effort during World War II, and so they they developed the acclimation program you know for the people, and that was you know at the time we were being contacted by human type of extraterrestrials, part of the larger humanity that's out there in which we were just a small uh, part of. And uh, in, in 1953, uh, Timothy Good referenced uh, a, a top military official that that he came, he had some UFO, he had some UFO material in 1953, and he brought it up, and this is the, the military brass in the UK. And there was a Mr. Janus there, and this Mr. Janus was apparently an extraterrestrial, and he ex he explained to it, explained very well, and he says that we don't intend to contact you at this time, the general public at this time, because uh, we consider you to be half civilized. But over time, as you move into space, we will have to uh, to have to interact with you and in, in an open uh, manner. 
And so the military in the U.K. was contacted there. Eisenhower was contacted apparently uh, by the Blondes or the, or the Nordics in 1954, I think it was. And uh, that, didn't, that didn't go too well, uh, what I was told from even one of my own sources here locally. And there's a Gerald Light uh, account of this meeting in which uh, several uh, the three ships landed on a runway and the, the, the human extraterrestrials, uh, bonds, uh, uh, men and women came out, a little group came out, and they went into this hangar uh, that the military and Eisenhower was there and Gerald Light was there and, and a lot of soldiers and stuff and whatever, and they stayed in there for two days. And uh, basically these extraterrestrials uh, uh, said that they would be willing to work with, work with us, work with humanity, providing that the military stop the nuclear testing at the time that they were, you know, uh, doing a lot of atomic testing. And they said that was very damaging, not even not only for our environment, but it was affecting them, too. And but the military was not willing to do that. And they were warned by these uh, more friendly extraterrestrials that there would be other types that would come that uh, would, would be much less, much less ethical and could create a real problem if they got involved with them. And naturally, that's what happened. That's what happened. They got involved with the Greys. And so these more human types just kind of backed off. They're still here. They're here even here in my local area in South Georgia, just north of Tallahassee, Florida. I've worked with contactees in this area. And, they're, they're, you know, I've watched the cat and mouse games with the military coming out of Moody Air Force Base. Uh, one of my contact friends, when I went on the Internet about it and everything, it was, you know, the jets were like a bunch of bees up there, and all, once in a while the UFO would just pop its light, just let us know that it was there. And then uh, I got on the Internet and talked about it, and the next day the whole area was smoked up with flares around my contact contactee's friend's house, which is mm. kind of funny because I <laughs> apparently picked off the – flight commander for going on the internet about the whole episode that was happening. And these were human uh, uh, blonde type extraterrestrials and then there's also some other types in my local area too that I, uh, that I came to learn a lot about through the, the contactees. So uh, there's, a, there's a lot of ethical extraterrestrials uh, but they've had, they, they've been sort of disinvited by our government because they won't cooperate with the shadow government. And so they, they're being kind of disinvited. They're being shot at, chased, you know, and whatever. The first sh shoot down apparently was in 1950, 1974. Colonel Corso had three accounts of it in his book, but I have a, a, a very detailed account that I got even before Kurt Corso came out with it in his book. I wish there was a shoot down in 1954. And then there was a... An alien was shot at Fort Dix later. I, I put that up on, on our site here just recently. Uh, so the more eth unfortunately, the more ethical types have been disinvited, and, and the, the ones that have been invited are the ones we really probably shouldn't be involved with, which is the Grays. And there seems to be a, some de uh, deals cut you know, technology in, in exchange for allowing the ex uh, experimentation on some of our citizens. Uh, for part of their hybridization program that the Greys were involved in, which is this, this, this whole situation is pretty serious. Then you have like the Tall Whites with Charles Hall, in which I researched and actually found more cases of this, and they're kind of kind of in between. They're they're fairly fierce. Uh, they're thin human type extraterrestrials. They have a base at Nellis Air Force ba uh, at Nellis uh, Air Force Base. Um, it's a little ways away from Area 51 that everybody knows about and whatever, it's, and up in the uh, near Tona, toward, toward Tonopah part of, of Nellis. And uh, the, the base was built uh, built around, around their um, sort of a pit stop that they had for traveling elsewhere, that it was kind of like a place where if they had damage to their craft or whatever, they could repair their craft and then they would they would go on. And Charles Hall... You can look that up on the internet, Charles Hall and the Tall Whites, and that's one of the very substantial cases because not only you have a lot of detail about this particular race of, be of, of human type beings, there are also a lot of other people who have seen that these particular types in the Las Vegas and uh, Reno, Nevada area, and so. Uh, there's been a lot of interaction going on behind the scenes with high-level military and with the global elite, 
but uh, and but the situation is really pretty serious in, in that the shadow government has been cutting deals and involved in technological, what they call technological transfer programs with some of the extraterrestrials that they shouldn't be involved with and disavowing these others. So we're trying to correct that. And a lot of stuff that Stephen Greer is doing and others that are going out and trying to uh, interface with friendly extraterrestrials is just a really good thing because, uh, like one of the one of the people that were involved in Let's Talk ET, um, Costa, you know, basically said that the more ethical a- extraterrestrials, because they are ethical, they have to have an invitation. They can't come in and crash crash the party, so to speak. They've got to have an invitation, and the more people that get interested and reach out to them, the more it allows them to intercede. Uh, in our behalf in, in, in our world, but, but we, have to, we have to be willing to invite them in because of their ethical nature, whereas the less ethical types, that's not a problem. Right. And so, yeah. exopo- so exopolitics is about, uh, the, uh, it's, it's, it's about the interactions between extraterrestrials themselves and also with us. It's sort of the politics of the universe. And so that's kind of what exopolitics is about. Um, that the, the, it used to be way back in the 50s they called uh, these, these, these things in the sky flying saucers and flying saucers had occupants, but the Air Force wanted to denigrate that situation and so they, they came up with UFOs, unidentified flying objects. So that's a conceptual trap for people because if it's an unidentified, then you're not thinking about you know, uh, occupants and interaction with, with, with the occupants and that sort of thing. And so... Uh, it's really was a step backwards, and so exopolitics is a step forward to get beyond the conceptual trap of UFO to exopolitics with, that, that has a basis of that, that we're involved with many different types of extraterrestrial races. It's a big universe out there. Quite a few of them are coming here, and they're interacting with us in a variety of ways, some of it ethical and some of it not so ethical, and some of it's more predatory. And so it just a, it's just basically the old adage is true, you know, as, as below, so above. And we live in a holographic universe, and all the things that happen to us here, they're happening elsewhere too, but just on a much larger scale. Yeah, that, that brings up the, uh, the case that, um, for example, if a human goes around abducting people or even, you know, abducting, let's just, let's just use people they would be accountable for and they would be brought to court in the, you know in any country so in that case have you heard or know of you know who who will hold these people accountable for their actions of a uh, um for abducting people like is there like an intergalactic court or or even <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me, for these people shooting down uh, ships for no reason. Well, the, the, you know, there's basically an, uh, an overall thing. You know, I'm, in, in a way, we're, we're getting getting this because we ourselves are half, civil, half civilized, so basically we have a tendency to attract other, other beings that are a lot like ourselves. And so, so you have this birds of a feather flock together kind of syndrome, you know, and, and what happens is, is there's a natural stra- stra- striation of you know, the more advanced beings cooperating amongst themselves in order to maintain a certain amount of balance, you, you know, in, in these systems. And I think the more ethical types, what they're trying to do is, is we're growing up, we're kind of like children that are growing up, we're kind of like teenagers now, and they have to let us make, make mistakes. They have to let us cut deals with the wrong types of extraterrestrials and, and learn our lessons the hard way. And so they're involved with maintaining a balance. They're not involved in trying to save us from ourselves, but they do want to create a situation in where we have free will. They don't want, you know, one race to come in and, and take us over or, or gain control over us. So we're kind of like a third world country in the midst of superpowers. And if, if one, one group of extraterrestrials tries to come in, it's like, you know, like the Russians going into Afghanistan. Well, they got into Afghanistan, and then the Americans, you know, supported the Taliban and whatever to get the Russians out. Now the, Amer- the Americans are in Afghanistan, and they're being pushed, pushed out, you know, with, with the Pakistanis, you know, and whatever. So 
you know, it's a complex situation, but we're kind of like a third world country surrounded by superpowers, and any particular superpower that tries to come in is going to, is going to be countermanded by other superpowers. And so it gives us a certain amount of free will to make the decisions of, of how we want to evolve. Do we want to evolve a bright future for ourselves? Or do we want to fuss and fight and scrap and kill each other and be violent, you know, and, and destroy ourselves or become enslaved by a more predatory race even than ourselves? And yeah. so what you, ha- what you have is you have, you know, we're the top predator on this planet as far as evolving on this planet, and other top predators are evolving on other planets. Some of them have a reptilian-type background. Some of them have a human, you know, human mammalian background. Some even seem to have a, a, a uh, evolutionary history that goes back into the insects. Because basically, nature, you know, I have an ecological background, and basically, na- nature has certain strategies that work. You know, exo- ex- exoskeletons versus endoskeletons, and that sort of thing. And you know, if the asteroid that that uh, wiped out the dinosaurs had been even worse and left only insects, an intelligent insect might have evolved on this planet. Or if the asteroid had not even hit, the mammals wouldn't have been able to evolve because the dinosaurs were already so, so, so well developed, they would have probably had an intelligent dinosaur evolve on this planet. So you have top predators evolving on these plant, on, on, off the planets, and then they travel through space. And some people you know, try to you know, get the false impression that because the distances are so far that once you've got that kind of technology, you're going to be somehow you're going to be ethical and, and a friendly type. But it, that wasn't the way and during the voyages of the you know, the oceans were impassable, or practically impassable at one time, but when the Europeans got the technology to go across the ocean, did that make them more ethical than the natives that they conquered and colonized and abused? So it's no, it's no different on this much larger scale. So we as a species, as individuals and as a species, are by our very actions and our thoughts and our emotions creating for ourselves the type of world that we're going to be in in the future. And I would like to see humanity you know, evolve to a, a more advanced ethical level of being much more civilized than what it is today rather than falling back into this uh, uh, disorder and chaos and possibly having to start from scratch again from a very primitive state of existence or becoming enslaved by an extraterrestrial race like the Greys that don't have any, that treat, us, treat our people basically like uh, we treat lab rats. And yeah. so... Uh, we have that choice. That unfortunately, the military and, and the, sh- the shadow government, the military-industrial complex, and what whatever has got, got things off on the wrong foot in secret, and we have to uh, as, uh, have to take responsibility of that because you know we get the government that we deserve. You know, a lot of you know. So uh, we've got to take back control over our future, and that's what a lot of what my book is about is providing uh, people the tools. Uh, the conceptual tools to understand the big picture, what's going on, and once you understand what's going on, once you have a roadmap, then you know how to make the right decisions to move humanity forward into the future and create a bright future as envisioned in Star Trek rather than some kind of Orwellian uh, global plantation of a few elite masters and many, many slaves. Right. Yeah. Well, my question is that being there's like a, a growing community of people who are contactees and, and involved with different species on a more um, <clears throat> positive note. And it's only a very tiny, tiny percent that is involved with the probably more negative type. Um, at what point do the the uh, like the human types or any other type that's more um, beneficial to us would they say like okay we've been invited by you know the public kind of thing more than the government like what's my point is like how do they look at it what's more important because you only have a small group that knows what's happening and is doing their own thing you know for themselves where you have this growing type uh, group like us who's becoming more more and more aware and many of us are having contacts already. So at what point can we say, okay, we don't want these guys anymore. We're disinviting them and we want these guys, for example. That's right. That's basically what we're doing now is, is, is that we're turning the tables on, on the global elite and the special interests that have 
that ha are in control over governments through the through the manipulation of money and and, and other other means, and and so we're actually what we're doing, and this is why you know the the, the concept of the extraterrestrial cultural center evolved out of of my book when I made when I made my book free to the public, which can be read. They can they can find the link on my blog. Uh, which anybody can read off the website or they can download it as PDF, that uh, it was only three or four days later after that that I saw somewhere where Wendell Stevens had been, you know, the researcher, Wendell Stevens, contact researcher, had been uh, approached by an extraterrestrial talking about the need for an, uh, an extraterrestrial culture, uh, cultural center. And so I kind of forgot about it, and then I woke up in the middle of the night about three three days later with this whole concept of, ex, of the extraterrestrial cultural center forming in my mind. And so we've built this up on Facebook now, and people that are on Facebook can just type in extraterrestrial cultural center, and you'll come to our home page that then links to the divisions that we're creating for this. And, and, and what we're envisioning is, is that a network of these cultural centers all over the world that will not only be interfacing and working with extraterrestrials, but also educating the public in a very positive and beneficial manner, and create an infrastructure to, to invite invite the more ethical ETs, and also coordinate uh, to a certain degree a lot of these different uh, extraterrestrial contact groups uh, that are going out now, like Stephen Greer's group and other spinoffs of, of a lot of what Stephen Greer has done and whatever. And, and so basically the more that we do this, the more it turns the tables on the global elite and their, and their uh, so-called gray allies uh, and other types of unethical types that may be involved with them trying to create an autocratic uh, uh, new world order with, with uh, just a few people, at, uh, masters at the top, and then they, the extraterrestrials themselves, controlling those global elite. Uh, and and there, that thereby is very efficiently controlling the rest of this planet and its and its, res, and its both its human resources and other natural resources. And so, uh, for, but first we've got to understand what's going on. And so I spent 40 years, you know, trying to figure that out and dedicating most of my life to that. I live very, uh, very uh, frugally. Uh, have my own cabin that I built, live on about $500 a month, so I've been able to dedicate myself to understanding what's going on, and I'm six, almost 65 years old now, and I wanted to pull all that knowledge together so that other people could build on that, just like I've been able to benefit from building on the good works of others that came before me. And so I'm trying to pass that knowledge on to, to newer generations so they, they'll have a leg up on what's the next step here is here and we got to get beyond collections and analysis to issues and implications of contact and a lot of people in the UFO community are still stuck on collections and analysis and there's a good reason for that they the, some of these UFO major UFO groups have been manipulated by the intelligence community to keep the people in this mode of unidentified flying objects rather than extraterrestrials in, interacting with us on a, on a daily basis all over the world uh, and, 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 and in fact, a very massive way. I don't think anybody has any idea just how many people are interacting with ethical extraterrestrials. There's some indication that quite a, there's quite a few people have interacted, you know, maybe even hundreds of thousands of millions have interacted with, with the greys that have been forcibly abducted and experimented upon. Uh, but there may be much larger numbers of people involved, you know, in, or in maybe not face-to-face -face, but telepathically, uh, with the more advanced races. So we're kind of in the, in the middle, uh, like I said, kind of in the middle of a very complex game, uh, sort of game that's being played, uh, being played out as to who's, the, who's going, uh, what, what groups are going to, is this planet going to fall into? Is it going to fall into these, to the, to the groups, these less ethical, of confederations, or is it going to fall into, are we going to make the decision to, 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 to hang with the more, uh, ethical confederations and whatever. It's the same decision a child child has to make when they're a teenager. You know, they when they're growing up, they got to make. Ultimately, it's up to them whether they whether they go Breaking Bad or whether they go, uh, you know, towards a positive future for themselves and humanity. Do you think this is ultimately a numbers game with the the people on the planet as far as uh, you know uh, how many people are you know looking for. Uh, some uh, some communication and maybe some assistance from 
uh, benefit, uh, you know, the the uh, the good guys out there, or, or you, I think you know what I mean. Uh, do you think it's a numbers game ultimately? I, I think ultimately it's a num- it's it's a it's a numbers game. You know, I I think you know it's, it's just like in a person's own mind. You know, it, you know we all you know think destructive thoughts and then we think constru- constructive thoughts, and so in the universe. There's basically two forces. One is the creation, uh, the constructive force that builds things up, and the other force is the force that tears things down, the destructive force. So, a person evolves, or a human species, or a civilization evolves when there's more construction going on than destruction. But when the destruction accelerates and overcomes more than the construction, then you de-evolve back down. And so it's kind of like that. So it's just like with an individual, you know, because basically we are in a fractal world or, or in a holographic world. So a civilization is doing the same thing. The civilization rises up with, with new uh, innovation and creativity, and this creates institutions. For instance, you know, the, the oil industry was what, and, and, and the motor car was once a vibrant, evolving, uh, uh, evolving institution. But then what happens is, is the, once these, these institutions become established, they then try to prevent new innovation that could throw them out of business. For instance, they don't want to end up, uh, the oil companies don't want to end up in the same situation that the gas light companies ended up with with the invention of the light bulb. Just when Edison invented the light bulb, the stock of the gas light companies went from $100 a share down to $1 a share, and they were still making money. And so... The, the technologies involved with extraterrestrial uh, craft you know, are involved with very cheap, um, non-polluting technologies that would put the whole oil industry out of business. And then a, a levitating, flying craft like the Jetsons, you know, we're talking, you know, back in the 50s, would put the whole automobile industry out of business. It would put the, not only that, it would put the whole infrastructure for the auto industry, roads, bridges, and all that out of business. So all these established interests, you know, ha- ha- have uh, uh, understood in the early 50s because they were intimately connected with the intelligence community. They went beyond collections and analysis to issues and implications in, in, in order to protect their industries and protect themselves at the expense of the rest of us, of the whole of humanity and the destruction of the environment. So we should have gone to, you know, we should have gone out of fossil fuels back in the 50s and 60s and now be with completely clean, cheap energy sources. But, that you know, that would put the uh, cheap energy, it would put the, the transmission companies out of business, the electric companies out of business, the nuclear reactor, you know, companies out of business and whatever. So there's very, very strong incentives to not let these new technologies come in, 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 into the marketplace if, they, if they're not being controlled. Uh, you know, like Colonel Corso was talking about the day after Roswell, you know. So, you know, they're making trillions of dollars off of reverse engineering this stuff and, and moving it into and advancing our technology, but they're also saving themselves trillions of dollars by excluding uh, these technologies that would put, put their, their special interests out of business. So they're not about to disclose any more than they absolutely have to. So. You know, I've been pushing for disclosure, you know, a good part of my life and have, you know, uh, co-founded Operation Right to Know. We had demonstrations in front of the White House. But pushing governments uh, for disclosure is, is not going to work very well because they're controlled by these special interests. So this idea is very appealing to go around governments and go directly to the ETs themselves, invite the ETs to come down and disclose and that'll put pressure on governments and, and these elites and reverse this whole destructive process and create the bright future that we deserve like that was outlined in Star Trek. Right, right. Do you, do you think that that's why you've been getting a lot of this um, recently? You know, it seems like the more negative stories get out um, more openly and, you know, because everybody pretty much knows what a gray is. Uh, but, you know, if you talk to the average Joe about, you know, Palladian or feline beings or any other beings, they have no idea what you're talking about. Um, do you think the the government, that's why they're pushing these, like, negative uh, movies where right away, you know, let's be the patriots and fight the aliens and things like that? 
versus yeah, basically, basically the problem is out they're trying to they, again it, it you know you, you have to learn that a lot of these people that created this situation created this cover-up were very involved in magicians tricks and stuff back in the 30s and 40s and one of the things that you do is like the city uh, nasa city program and, you know it's basically uh is a dis- is is a uh distraction you know et is way out there someplace he's not in your own backyard so you're diverting the public attention away from what's really going on here locally, and so and so that they set up they set up these deceptive things, and so they're they're trying to make out like that you know that the problem you know is outside, but really we've been infiltrated by by these extraterrestrials now that called the Greys that uh, you know that basically uh, treat us as property and think of us as property. And it's a very serious situation, and so we've got to reverse this process. And the Greys would just assume that, that that everybody think they're the only ones around, that that we have to cooperate with them, and that's that. But we don't. We don't have to cooperate them. We can kick them out off this planet, and we can uh, invite in the more advanced extraterrestrial races. But we've got to get our consciousness up, and we've got and we've got to get out there and roll up our arm sleeves and get to work on building infrastructure. For, to, to invite, uh, make it easier for these uh, to, the, the more ethical extraterrestrials to be able to be allowed for, for, by their own rules, rules and regulations to in, intrude into our lives. And because they're not like the greys, they, they can't come in and, and intrude and, and, and uh, abuse, abuse us and make changes in us like the greys can do. They have to be invited in, in, in order to come and to help us and work with us. So they work and, off of uh, that that Star Trek philosophy type thing of the Prime Directive. Yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of like that, and it's basically you know uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Uh, you know, and so uh, if we're going to be a violent race and we're going to be hateful towards each other and whatever, you know, we are naturally are going to settle with the other less civilized races that are, are coming to this planet. Or we're going to collapse back down to a primitive state of existence, go back into the Stone Age again, and then have to slowly build our, build ourselves back up again. You know, probably one or the other. And so, it, the, so our future is, does not look very good. It, it, you know, it, uh, unless we have enough people that are not just com, not sitting around complaining and wasting a lot of time complaining, they're actually getting involved. So. Basically, once I explain all this, you know, and I, and I provide, I think I've got like 160 something or 70 something links to, to the source material in my book that that that, that references that spaces for the concepts in the book, and that and the, and the concepts. Once you grasp those concepts, then you can go out and make decisions and start moving forward, you know, like with the extraterrestrial cultural center. Uh, 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 complex that we're involved with now and so we, we we invite people if you're on we're doing most all our organizing on facebook right now but you know all you got to do is just type in extraterrestrial cultural center and you'll go to our home facebook page and then that'll lead to other divisions which are really our working groups we have a, um, a center contact division we have a center research and investigations division we have a center administration division we have a center media division, uh, and so we have five divisions, and then those divisions break up into departments, and then those departments break up into tasks and whatever. So we're organizing. We, we've only been on this, doing this for about three weeks, but we've come a long ways, uh, and, and and we've got a few good people now, and we need a lot more to fill out these divisions and fill out, you know, and fill out these departments and whatever, and get to work on building this 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 global infrastructure in which we'll have uh, extraterrestrial centers, a uh, network of them all over the world in, in many, many different countries, in which we'll have in, inside the cultural center, we'll have like a museum with, with wax, wax models of different types of extraterrestrials for the public to see. Uh, we'll have, uh, we have an education division that will, uh, will basically have an archi- uh, historical archive. There are... Just Albert Rosales has 17,000 cases, humanoid, just humanoid cases, cataloged over the last century or so. And uh, Emmanuel Lemoy or whatever, Lemoy has 
a very large database. And so these huge databases, and so investigation research is going to try to take these huge databases and, and take this information and, and build an encyclopedia galactica of extraterrestrial civilizations. So that's going to take that's going to be quite a task to do, and. So we'll have physical centers, but before we get the physical centers, we've got to build, get an organization up and running, and and then we build the start building the physical centers around the planet, which is going to involve many millions of dollars to do. Right now, you know, we're not we're not even incorporated. We you know we're just you know doing you know, building our organization here on Facebook. I've been working on a business plan uh, in, in the administration division. And just pulling our and pulling key people together in order to expand this, uh, continuously expand this, and become a, a force to be reckoned with all over the planet, and to also help coordinate to be a kind of a clearinghouse. We don't even have any idea how many different, you know, not only how many contact people are out there. We don't even have an idea of how many contact groups there are. You know, I mean, let's talk. ET has. 5,000 people in in 30 different countries in groups. Uh, SETI has has thousands too. But all the in these other languages and down in South America, there's other contact groups all over the world. But we don't have any idea just how many people are having ethical contact. You know, we have some idea how many people have have, are having unethical contact with the Greys, but we don't have really no idea. Uh, as to how many people are involved in this sort of contact. So we've got to kind of compile that information in our contact division and pull that together in a kind of a clearinghouse process. Mm. And so uh, it's no accident that when I, once I made my book free on the Internet that these, these thoughts started coming into my mind and this whole concept of extraterrestrial cultural center network around the planet uh, came to be, and and I thought I was just going to be able to, you know, after I got this book out, that was kind of my mission being completed, and that basically that I would just sit back and just promote my book for the last part of my life. Yeah, but did you I was know. really wrong, you know. Apparently, the next step is to put this knowledge into action, and that's what the extraterrestrial cultural center is about. Yeah, no, no retirement for you yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, I figure I got five more good years. <clears throat> my father started deteriorating uh, in, in his early 70s so that may happen to me too so I've got to, I've got to do what I can here in the next next several years to get this organization up and running and bring you know, have a have a decent operating budget and maybe even get to the point where we can start uh, bring in a CEO that has 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 a network to to uh, millions of dollars of uh, funding that it's going to take to build these extra build these extraterrestrial centers all around the world. So it's quite a challenge. Uh, you know, I'm learning a lot. I don't have a lot of management experience. I'm a conceptual type of person, and a lot of people are getting involved. They're more conceptual people too. But so we're having to learn, kind of flying by the seat of our pants. You know, basic management. Uh, uh, techniques and 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 whatever, and hopefully more and more professional management people will come in and take over for us, and then we can move move on up and and stay in the more conceptual area where we really need to be. Build it, and they will come, right? Yeah, well, that that that's basically what the thought was: is that if, you know if we if we build this and it's built right, and and we keep our level of consciousness up. You know, it will present a powerful invitation because it will organize a lot of what's going on already, and has already been done into a manageable form. And just like the Encyclopedia Galactica, it'd be just really good to be able to just open up and say, you know, you know, uh, have an introduction and open up to the blondes, you know, open up to the grays, open up to the uh, to the tall white civilizations and, and and be able to read and study up, study up on that based upon the huge databases that we that we have. Uh, my friend Mike Jamison, you know, he he kind of took over the the research investigation research division, and he's a little bit of a skeptical kind of person, but he just got blown away by just how many different case, how how many uh, tens of thousands of cases there are of extraterrestrial contact. That have been cataloged, uh, and and that's that's really going to be a tough project to be able to kind of try to pull all that together and sort it out into different types and then figure out how many different types of races that seem to be inter, you know interacting with us and something about 
what, what those uh, extraterrestrial races are about, what their science is, what their policy is, what their social life is, what their family life is, and all that sort of a thing. And as this thing evolves and extraterrestrials are able to become more and more uh, prominent and, and there can be more and more face-to-face -face contact, then we get more and more information and we get access to their databases and, and which we can in, in, in greatly advance the Acropedia Galactica. I, I would expect NASA, I mean the NSA and the CIA already have an Acropedia Galactica built built up, you know. But we don't have access, you know. We don't have access, and we're not allowed to have access to that, even though it's being built with our taxpayer money. And so we've just got to, you know, you know, build up an infrastructure and do it ourselves. You know, we can't, we can't, we're not, we can't expect the government to disclose. We've got, we've got to work around the government because the governments right now are being controlled by these entrenched interests that are trying to protect their, their industries from, from, from uh, being overwhelmed uh, by, uh, by these uh, extraterrestrial, other extraterrestrial uh, civilizations and technologies. Hmm. There has been a tremendous amount of, uh, well, it seems to me like a, a huge increase in sightings here in the last year. Uh, have you noticed that also? Yes, that's corresponding with, with the interest of people of having, having contact. I think Stephen Greer, you know, a lot of people give Stephen Greer a lot of grief, and he does make some mistakes. But to his credit, he has got a lot of people out there in the field asking asking the, for contact with, with, extra, with ethical extraterrestrials. Now, he doesn't believe there's any unethical or, or, or predatory extraterrestrials, which is a problem. Uh, but he has got uh, thousands and thousands of people out there in the field, and that's having an impact. It's allowing, I mean, I just saw a case the other day where uh, somebody saw a, a craft and they put the flashlight at it, and the craft answered. And that's happening more and more frequently now. And so yeah. because we're more open to them, becoming more open to them, it allows them to come, come, come to us and become more open to us, you know. But they have, this, they have to work the fear factor, and we have a lot of, a lot of us have a lot of fear. And not, not only rightfully so, I suppose, with the, with the abusive extraterrestrials that are treating us like lab rats, but even with the ethical types, there's a, there's a fear of the unknown there that's pretty powerful, so that they've got to, you know, they, they can't just step, step out and on the, uh, onto the White House lawn. They, they're, because they're ethical, they've got to be careful with us. They understand that we're very fragile and that, you know, we can be destroyed mentally and emotionally very easily just by a craft come. you know, we don't know anything about it, a craft just coming up close is it's pretty devastating to most people. You know, one out of ten people will say that they've seen extra industrial class up, a craft up close in these poles, and it's been pretty devastating to a lot of people, even though when there's no harm done or anything, it's just the idea just, just throws you into them, a yeah. kind of existential yeah. crisis that everything you thought you knew, you don't know anymore. Right. And that there's just much greater, vaster reality that's in, in, intruding in our, into our lives and that we are inviting into our lives to a certain degree because it's time for us to move into space, and we are moving into space. And so it also makes it where the extraterrestrials then have to become more and more involved with the public. Yeah, you know what I noticed. We're coming up to the top of the hour, but what I noticed is that there's um, a lot. You know, very few people like you and Stephen Greer and um, even James Gillen and a lot of different people talk about the more positive thing. It's like a lot of ufologists I've noticed have been stuck with this negative thing, and not saying that I'm not saying that it doesn't exist because I look at the intergalactic um, uh, community the same as I do as humans, you know, it's like, well, you know, am I scared of every human I meet? No, but there are some really shady ones out there. And so I would say, you know, it you're, should you're be the by same. the company you keep. Yeah, and, exactly. you know, and, 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 and basically, uh, you know, the, the, what happened was is that the shadow government cut deals with the Greys uh, in the middle to later 50s, and you know, the people like Bill uh, um, you, you house actually worked with the Gray on the flying saucer simulators. And, you know, so we have a lot of cases of, of Grays actually working with our military, helping us build up our technological develop, you know, development and whatever. 
but also that that part of that deal was for technology was that we would allow uh, uh, they would allow it's kind of it's kind of it's, it's, it's a way I explained it in my book it's kind of like a modern day slave trade you know the basically the old, the white slavers went to the Africans they just didn't go out and catch catch Africans the the, the chiefs sold their own people to the white slavers for iron cooking pots and and utensils and 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 metal for their spear points. And so this is this is actually is, is the same thing has happened over again. So a lot of our people have been sold down the river. You know, hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of people have been, you know since the late fifties. And so naturally, it's had a big impact, you know, on the UFO community and whatever. And it sort of washed out the more ethical types that were that were more talked about in the in the earlier part of the fifties. But these more ethical types are still here. They just had to kind of back off a little bit and let and let us learn a hard lesson here. And now we're, you know, we're learning our lessons, and we're inviting them in. And you'll, you'll eventually see more and more, as we're seeing now, more and more ethical contact, and less and less of contact, hopefully, with the predatory types, and, and slowly push the predatory types back, back up, out and off this planet. Hmm. Yeah. So we reached to the uh, top of the hour, and for those uh, first hour listeners, want to give you a chance. Uh, where can people, if I wanted the uh, physical book, can I still get it? You you can get the physical book. It's on Amazon. Uh, uh, if you go to my blog, you, you know you you can find the uh, web page for the book in which you can read it for free, uh, or you can download it on a PDF. But there's also links to Amazon, or you can just type in the Amazon UFOs, Exopolitics, and New World Disorder, and you can get the print book that way if you want to. And and you may be able to still get the Kindle. Uh, Kindle's uh, the print book. It, you know, it's a 370-something page book. You know, I made it very reasonably priced at $16, and Amazon uh, has reduced the price to a certain degree, and the Kindle is only like $5. But uh, I, I pretty much forego all my Kindle, you know, sales by just making the the book public. And I just felt like I needed to do that to get it out to as many people as possible because people need the the, the knowledge that's in this book. Uh, yeah. It's re refreshing to hear that, Ed. I mean, I, uh, just that in itself, uh, you know, uh, garners a lot of respect for me. Uh, yeah, well, I, you know, I get a little trickle down, you know, on, on the print now, and even a little Kindle, because some people really want to read Kindle, you know, and so they'll pay the five bucks. But the important thing is get this out to large, uh, large enough people. I got it out to 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 thousands of people, you know. Putting out free Kindles to a certain degree, you know, when I was actually selling the selling the book and even se and selling the Kindles, what I did there was that they had these free Kindle promotions, and so so 90% of the of the uh, readership was or 80% of the readership was free Kindles, but that got to thousands of people. But now I'm getting working on tens of thousands of people, and since the book I got the book out on the web page, there's been like about 7,000 hits on it, so. Uh, that's not that many, you know, readers because they keep coming back to read and whatever. But I'm 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 getting into the tens of reaching tens of thousands of people now at this point, and then hopefully hundreds of thousands. Well, word of mouth, word of mouth is huge. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Huge. Yeah, it's huge. So because uh, this, book, this, this book is good, so and and people do tell other people about it, and so it spreads well. Yeah. Have you um, started a, a GoFundMe or a Kickstarter or something like that for the um, Galactic Centers? Or uh, not, yeah. not yet. Right now, it's just everybody's volunteer, and we can build this organization on Facebook very well by creating these Facebook pages. At, at some point, once we get our web page up and I go on to shows like Coast to Coast that have millions of listeners, uh, then we'll bring in really large numbers of people, and we'll get some real professional management people in, and then we'll, you know, be able to fund an operating budget, um, and then start paying our people a little bit anyway, and then start working on a capital budget in order to uh, to fund the creation of these centers. We already got Max, who's a faster, who's an architect, uh, who's. Uh, by next week, we should have the architectural drawings of one of the centers uh, 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 done, and so we'll be able to put that up on our site on Facebook and you and and use that. And so we're moving along very rapidly. I was getting pretty burnt out the first week that I got involved in this, and now I've been able to back off. There's been some good people coming on board, and today I spent about six hours posting to about 220, 240 
Facebook groups uh, on Facebook. You know, uh, it took me about six hours to do, but that'll bring in quite a few more people uh, to the to the center on Facebook. And then pretty soon we will be moving off of Facebook into other venues, web pages, and all that sort of stuff. But Facebook's really good for for for, for the early development or organization. I'm finding out. Cool. So we're. Um... We're going to move on to the second hour, and we're going to take a small break here. Tom? Now, so, uh, yeah, if you're not a member yet, I would urge you to uh, click that Join button and become a member of the 120 Radio and uh, have access to all that second hour content. Uh, we do really appreciate you guys listening, and, man, we love you so much. Uh, condemnation without investigation is a height of ignorance. The love you denies the pain you carry. And we'll see you guys in the second one. 